Giovanni Persico. I work as a child neuropsychiatrist and as a lab leader at University Campus Biomedico in Rome and at Mafalda Luce Center for Pervasive Developmental Disorders in Milan. My special interest at this time is in biomarkers and the history of biomarkers in psychiatry is a long one and unfortunately not as successful one as one would like it to be. Biological markers of disease are quantitative variables measurable using reliable methods and associated with the disease in the general population. Biomarkers would be extremely useful in psychiatry and in particular in the autism clinic for several reasons. Looking at autism specifically, they would be very useful in supporting early diagnosis, as you can see summarized in this slide, in sporadic cases, especially early on, 18 to 30 months, when sometimes it's very difficult for a clinician to come up with a definitive idea of whether and to what extent the child will end up having an autism spectrum diagnosis. Also, families that want to have a second child after the first one was diagnosed with autism. How useful would it be to be able on the day of birth to estimate the risk of abnormalities in his or her behavior in such a way as to personalize follow-up visits and personalize behavioral intervention strategies, which at that point could work for disease prevention rather than rehabilitation. Biological markers of disease would also help us perhaps identify those children which spontaneously have a favorable developmental trajectory, which means that they come out of the spectrum without almost any intervention. Finally, they would be immensely useful in providing us indications on which children would best respond to which behavioral treatment response. Behavioral, treatment response, behavioral treatments, especially when very intensive, are also very costly for the family and for society. And it will be increasingly requested by national health systems that biological founded indications be provided. One final issue that we will describe uh, in greater detail later on will be to guide personalized molecular drug therapies through one of the several drugs which are currently in the pipeline to tackle not comorbidities, but rather the autism core symptoms. Now, there is a long history, we said, of biomarker research in autism and in psychiatry in general. And there are many biomarkers in, uh, in autism. For example, think of serotonin blood levels, which are elevated in a large percentage of autistic patients and were described initially as far back as in the 60s. Now, unfortunately, none of these different biomarkers, be it biochemical, hormonal, genetic, um, immunological, brain imaging, neuropsychological or neurophysiological, alone has sufficient specificity and sensitivity to be used in the clinical setting. So in some way, what now is possible is to approach this problem using a different strategy. And as you can see on this slide, starting from the biological foundations of a complex disorder and very heterogeneous disorder as autism spectrum, we have to consider that genetics will provide a large amount of information, but then on top of this information, we nowadays are able, thanks to microarray technologies and to second generation DNA sequencing, we're now able to add on top of this methylomics information, genome-wide expression from peripheral cells, which regards both genes and uh, non-coding RNAs as well as microRNAs, proteomics information, metabolomics information. Now, all this information collected at the level of the single individual is now, puts us now in the condition to be able to select using the appropriate statistics, which would be support vector machine, uh, neural network based statistics, uh, a panel, multi-marker diagnostic panel, employing several different variables coming from different levels of information within the same individual. 
And this panel would then help us interpret also more complex biomarkers, including neurophysiological, brain imaging, neuropsychological biomarkers. All this ultimately to lead to the characterization of subgroups which share specific characteristics and which can be reliably identified using these diagnostic panels. Now, in order to do this, the first thing, the first uh, procedure which is necessary to implement is the collection of the appropriate biomaterials. And this slide is just an example of the work that we've done with Barbara Ruggeri, with Gunther Schumann, and with many others of the EU Ames Consortium in order exactly to do this type of thing in uh, ASD patients and their first degree relatives. And as you may notice from this slide, when you collect biomaterials for biomarker studies, you really need to think carefully at which biomaterials will be used for which level of information and which purpose. And if you do this, then in the end, you will have the biomaterials you need. Now, why are we doing this? Just for diagnostic purposes? No, no, we're doing this also because we believe very much in tailoring psychopharmacology in the future for specific needs. We have to move, and we are beginning to see this happening from non-specific psychopharmacology, which nowadays can at the most tackle is the comorbidities such as aggressiveness, insomnia, and hyperactivity to personalize molecular drug therapies which are really aimed at tackling core symptoms of autism, deficits in social behavior, deficits in communication, and insistence on sameness. Now, there are several drugs which are in the pipeline currently for different uh, syndromic forms of autism or other syndromes which in some ways are related to autism. And I will just remind you of some examples. Uh, phase two trials for IGF-1, phase two trials for Mglur-5 antagonists and GABA-B agonists, um, phase two trials for minocycline or for inhibitors of the mTOR pathway such as Averolimus. Um, oxytocin, intranasal oxytocin or bumetanate for resistant epilepsy, treatment resistant epilepsy. Now, which drug will work in which patient? That's the question. And it's a question that has to be, um, has to be taken into consideration in designing phase three trials, because unless biomaterials are collected and unless the appropriate biomaterials are collected, phase three trials may end up showing no effect, essentially not because the drugs are ineffective, but because they're effective only, they're effective perhaps, but only on 10% of the patients. So we need to be able to go back and identify the patients which respond to each specific drug. And this will be immensely useful for phase three trials. And it is conceivably going to be very useful also in the clinical practice when these drugs come to be available. 